I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. We are about 15 miles north of Nashville, Tennessee. We're a suburb of Nashville, and uh, people don't know what we teach. I teach things that hardly anybody else teaches. Um, I don't hear anybody teaching the way I teach, and I don't mean that in a boast. It's very depressing when I realize people can't see the truth of God's Word. I teach that Christmas is Christ's Mass. It's paganism. It's the Roman Catholic Mass. I figured that out when I was about 12, uh, watching the Pope on TV about 1951, and I'm sitting there saying, is this Christ's Mass? And I was hitting the nail on the head. Easter is Ishtar. It's, Easter is a is an Eastern goddess of among the uh, English people. It was an ancient goddess, not has nothing to do with God or Jesus. Easter comes from Ishtar or Ashtart or Aster, which is the word star. And uh, they worshiped the stars in the ancient world among the pagans. And we teach that predestination is true. And God does not love everybody. I didn't make that up. The Bible said God loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil, before they were born. Don't you get that? Look at Romans 9, look at Romans 8, look at Ephesians, the first chapter, and it's all over the Bible. And then we teach things that other people don't like that God creates evil I did a paper on God creating evil it's got hundreds of verses on it out of the Old Testament said God says I create evil uh, he says he says he does that he says I kill I make alive I wound I heal and we have these people writing to us from all over the world and uh, I like to answer some of their questions the best I can and uh, Maureen in Texas writes to us, Hello, Miss Mary. I hope you and everyone there at Grace and Truth Ministries is doing well and keeping safe. Thank you so much for teaching, for reaching out to me. It was honestly a great surprise. I would definitely love it if y'all were to send me some videos. I'm still a baby believer and still in progress of reading the full Bible for the first time, always looking to grow and love the truth, even though it's not the easiest at times. Also, so, sorry my donations are less than before. There were some changes made in my situation, but I'm always happy to support and do what I can, thanks to the grace of God. My address for the videos is, and she sends that, I wish y'all all good health and hope y'all take care. Thank you so much. Thank you much again. Maureen in Texas. Then I got an email from Nate Martin in Hutto, Texas. He's got a question about a verse over here in Lamentations. He wrote us last week, and I evidently either misread it or he misprinted it. I don't know which, but it don't matter. I'll approach it again. And Nate says, Hello, Pastor Jim and Grace and Truth family. Will you please explain Lamentations 3.33 for me? Your attention was diverted, and you read Lamentations 3, verses 1 through 3. Instead, much agape and phileo, Nate Martin in Hutto, Texas. Lamentations 3, 33. For he doth not afflict willingly, nor grieve the children of men. Now, I understand why he would write that. That's because I'm always talking about how God... Uh, afflicts his children well you're going to have to look see as soon as you write something like this the first thing I do is look up the words in the, in the verse if you have a concordance 
you can look up the words afflict, willingly, and grieve. Because you're going to have to know what. You've got a dozen words for the word afflict and grieve. This word afflict is the word ana, A N A H. It means to humble self. God's not going to humble to you or me. He's going to insist that we humble to him. That's the same word used over in the 16th chapter of Leviticus for the fast on the Day of Atonement. That's used for that. It means to afflict the soul. Ana. So God says, I'm not going to humble to you. And it's a uh, it's a word that means, uh, and then he says, I'm not going to humble to you. And uh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Excuse me. Let me get back over here to lamentation. Lamentation, excuse me. Let me get over here. Afflict, then you got to look at the word grieve. There's a half a dozen words for the word grieve. You can't just, if you, do you know how I answer your questions? I look the words up in a strong, exhaustive concordance. That's how I do it. And then he says over here in Lamentations, when you look at the word afflict, Afflict is the word, is the word ana, and then the word willingly is the word leb, L-E-B. Leb is the word heart, means the center of all things. In fact, when you look up heart in the McClinic and it's strong, it will tell you that the desires of a person. It's like when you look up over in Proverbs, delight thyself also in the Lord. He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. That doesn't mean if you delight in the Lord, he'll give you the lust of the flesh. The heart was the place of all sensuality and understanding. When you see the heart in Scripture, it means understanding. In fact, when you see one of the apostles, Lebius, it comes from Leb, it means the heart. And uh, then you look at the word willingly. Willingly, it, willingly is the word Leb, or heart. You look at the word grieve, and it means cause to grieve. God doesn't do this. He does this when we are in our sin. He doesn't do it. He doesn't just, out of the clear blue sky, give you grief. He gives you grief when you get in your sin. And you don't get there until you get old enough to know that you're sinning. So he will give you that. But you've got to look these words up. They're not always the same word. That's a must. I hope that will help you some. James Hassler in East China, Michigan writes, Hello, Brother Jim. Due to my new belief in your teachings. Now, James has been with us, what, 10 years or something like that. For the, well, he says, for the last 10 years, I have no more friends. Welcome to my world. <laughs> I have very few friends. My friends are the people that come to grace and truth. Outside of grace and truth people, I don't have anybody that I'm close to. If people do not believe in these, that Christmas is pagan and God doesn't love everybody and they don't believe in predestination, what have I got to fellowship with them about? Nothing. I still haven't come across anyone who can see and hear the truth of God's Word. Well, I first, let me tell you this. I carry DVDs in my pocket. And I give away sometimes two, three, four, five in a day. 
And you know how many calls I've gotten off of people getting those DVDs? I've given away DVDs, cassettes. I've given away VCR tapes. Back for the last 30 years, I've never gotten one call. Not one. That's the way it is. If you get one or two good believing friends in a lifetime that believe these truths, that's going to be a good average. So I don't have any fellowship either. And then he quotes Mark 5:19. How be it? Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Thank you. James Hassler in East China, Michigan. Well, I'm sure that man didn't have many friends either. You never will when you take a stand for truth. There's only few are going to find the narrow way. Morgan in central New Jersey. Good afternoon, Pastor. Hey, Morgan, how you doing? It's with great joy that I address you as such, Pastor. I've been listening to your messages for a few years, and I must say, Pastor, that ever since I started listening, my entire biblical understanding has tremendously increased which strengthened my faith and conviction. And I thank God through Jesus Christ for you and the brothers and sisters in the faith at Grace and Truth Ministry. Pastor, I'm located in central New Jersey area, so most of what I'm getting are what's on the website, which I'm so grateful for. I would love to be able to watch and listen to your most recent messages. We can send those to you. Just give us your address and may email it to us, and we'll put you on the we'll put you on the list to get our messages. Now, some of our messages are being put on there by Tom, the guy that takes care of our internet, and uh, so I don't know which ones are. Some of them are on there, and but we will send you any message you want. We don't charge you anything. They're free, which edifies my family and I in the most humbling way, not just because it's the Word of God, but because it is the Word of God, not twisted and convoluted, which is the only thing that binds the conscience. Please greet all the brethren in Christ. Morgan in central New Jersey. We love you, Morgan. Keep writing to us. We'll send you anything you want. We got, as of today, we got 4,243 master DVDs. I've got DVDs on every subject. I did four and a half years on the book of Revelation, 236 messages. And it was, and I still didn't finish it. I came back and did about 30 more. How can you do that on 22 chapters? Go through nearly every word, culture, custom, idiom, metaphor in the book. And it ties with everything in the Old Testament. I was, pre it says, uh, God predestinated me to hear your message. That's right. About my letter, the time I turn on YouTube channel. That is not an accident. You're right. I was predestinated for me to hear instantly by the will of God, so I know it is a sign of God that he works all things in my life, the good and the bad. But my question is, should I leave the Reformed Christian Church? <laughs> Most Reformed churches don't teach predestination like I teach it. They just don't. They don't tell you that God creates evil that God wants you to go through the fire and the trial. I don't know anything about your Reformed Church. You need to write to me and tell me. Most of them don't teach as hard as I teach. Even the people I know believe in predestination. I don't know many others that believe in predestination, but only my Reformed Church. Even if it's watered down, that's what most of them preach. I don't want to cut myself off those who believe in predestination. I'd be so lonely, alone and lonely. James in South Carolina. James, we love you, brother. We've got some people over there maybe you can fellowship with. 
keep writing to us, John Berean in Indiana. Pastor Jim, the Greek physician that came to her in 200 B.C., that's before the first century, spoke the Greek language and used Babto as to dip food in particular solution. A lot of people, even in, when they started using baptizo with Babto, they were very uh, liberal with what they were using it for. Even the Apostle Paul used it, but he used it in a in a uh, in a latitude in a way where he could spread out and use it however he wanted to. If you're trying to correct me, I'm not saying they didn't dip people in water, but I'm saying that's not the original meaning of the word. And then he says, you're right, Girdlestone said that the word has a dual meaning of definition, as do many words in many languages. You have said many times that baptism only means to die. I didn't say it only means that. I said it means to stain or die. I didn't say it only. You're putting the only in there yourself. To stain which is not true. Thank you for clearing this up. When a person uses loosely words, when Paul used the word baptize, he said, I thank God I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius and some of the household of Stephanus. For Christ sent me not to baptize, to it, to preach the gospel. Preach the gospel is that word euangelizo, E-U. E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-Z-O. It's our word evangelize. E-U-A-G-G-E-L-I-Z-O. It comes from you, meaning well, an angel, A-G-G-E-L-O-S, which is the word messenger or the word angel. They they used a, a latitude. It was a, they just kind of sp spread it out. When Paul said, I thank God I baptized, he didn't use the word, he didn't use just the word baptized. He used the word E, B, and I can't spell talking, E, B, A, P, T, I, Z, O. And when he said, I thank God I the word E before word is an augment and it means I baptized, not the Holy Spirit baptized. The reason he said that was because when he wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I baptized some of you in water and I did that ignorantly because I was a Pharisee and I was more zealous of the traditions paradosis of my father's there in Galatians the first chapter you guys that want to give me a hard time on this I believe the original meaning of the word was like Mr. Girdlestone said it meant to cover with a stain or die that was the original word but they used this latitude where they could just include anything in it and that's not what I believe uh, paradosis that's the word tradition. You have to understand, we're not the first people that started using latitude. Latitude is what goes around the world. Longitude is lengthwise, up and down. Latitude means it's a broad understanding that somebody just decides to use. I believe Paul used that when he followed the, pro the proselyte baptism, baptizing those people at cars. But he said, I thank God I didn't dip any more of you in water. That's what he was saying. And he was a Pharisee, and he was zealous of those laws of the Father. Why are you guys, why do you, want, why do you just want to write me and give me a hard time, John? Why don't you call me on the phone? I haven't said only. It it meant it didn't mean to dip, even though they dipped. That's the point. 
they started corrupting. I like what Mr. Enoch Pond said. He was a church historian. He's got a book called Enoch Pond Church History. He said the church began to get apostate at the end of the second century. He said at the end of the second century, from 1 AD to 2 AD, at the end of that second century, that's where they begin to get corrupt and the church begin to turn themselves over. This is what he said, to synods and councils. You guys that want to give me a hard time with your emails, you usually don't even know where I'm thinking or where I'm coming from. I've spent my life studying Bible. I don't believe, I've got one guy that writes me and says, well, God's anger can be feminine gender. I don't believe that. I don't care what professor says that. I don't believe God. It's crazy to say God inspired the whole word of God. And the Bible says in Psalms 12, and his word is pure. It says his word is pure in, in uh, the 30th chapter of Proverbs. If it's pure, then it wouldn't be kind of erratic. Well, God's wrath will be feminine over here. And over here in the 16th chapter of Revelation, it will be masculine. I don't believe God, just because Greek scholars don't know what to do with some words, it doesn't mean they can misapply them. And I believe that's what a lot of them do. I don't believe God would assert himself as feminine gender ever because he knows how to do that. Maybe the Greek scholars don't know. It's just like I heard uh, one of the Greek scholars that I've got on a, t on a DVD. He said, we really don't know what the words mean because they had musical tones to them, which we long forgot years ago. Look, I'm just trying to tell the people I do not believe in a water baptism at all. Never have believed in it. You do what you want to, John. All right. Got a couple of more of these. This is Rob in Jacksonville, Florida. Hello again, Brother Jim. Mary, Tom, Mike, and team. About 10 months ago, I made a commitment to watch every new message you put on YouTube. It's been quite the ride, and I have learned so much. It's amazing to see the Bible open up. I just make sure I watch every one and don't miss any, and I have found few sheep. Oh, you're like this other fellow wrote along the way that's because there's few that will find the narrow way it sure is a sight to see when the sheep hear they take right to the truth but sadly most people just want to quote mushy love and believe and be saved verses and don't care it's english and don't care it isn't the inspired word of god it is such a relief to know I can't change them and to move on to the next opportunity. You can't change nobody. I used to fight people years ago. I fought them on every point. I, nobody knows the Word of God perfectly. But don't let it contradict itself just because you don't know it perfectly. Thank God for all you. Thank God for all you, for all the team you do. This baptism series is wonderful, so full of information. I know the hearing ear was the gift at Pentecost, not speaking in another language, but Acts 19.5 shows where once they were baptized, they spoke in new languages, not new languages, new glossa. Glossa is the word foreign language. A glossary is a section of a book with words that are foreign to the average reader. Then said Paul, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. He didn't preach the baptism of water. He preached the baptism of repentance. Saying unto the people, 
that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When you heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with glossa, not Pentecostal jibber-jabber. They spake with foreign languages. They were in a foreign land. Paul was on his different journeys in a foreign land. You got to remember that Paul went all over the Mediterranean area and they didn't speak the Greek dialect. If they did, they had a different dialect than what was going on in Israel and prophesied. Just wondering what this really means. Look, do you have a concordance? Look it up in a concordance. It'll either be glossal or dialectos. Dialectos means dialect. They had a different dialect of the common street language in every city state. You need to get some books besides a strong concordance. You need to get books on culture, customs, idioms, metaphors, and so forth. Just wondering what this really means. It's certainly not jibber jabber in Pentecostal tongues. Thank you again. Rob in Jacksonville, Florida. You need to look at. Watch my DVDs on tongues. I've explained the whole thing in detail. We love you, Rob. Keep right. Kelly and Marlena Benson in Texas. They have been very faithful in supporting the ministry. We love you guys. They came up here several years ago. Busy with us. Hello, Jim and Mary. My wife and I just enjoyed listening to one of Jim's teachings from 2014. It made me realize I was supposed to ask about the next picnic date. Have y'all set one, Mike? June 3rd. June 3rd. June 3rd will be our picnic date. Has one been set yet? We want to come, but need to plan according, accordingly for the trip. Please let me know. Last time, I attended one in 2012, and my wife, who just left the Mormon church, is very excited to come and meet everyone and attend Sunday teaching. Thanks again. Love to all. Kelly and Marlena Benson in Texas. We love you guys. Keep writing. Write to us some more. All right. That's enough reading. We didn't have a lot to read. We get people from all over the world that write to us. Get people from Australia and, and from Europe and all over Africa writing to us and saying they love the truth. Let me say something about those of you that are trying to be contentious. You're trying to argue with me. If you got something to say like that, don't do it on our website. Don't do it on our Write to me or call me on my phone, 1-800-625-5409. If you want to talk about something that's controversial, but don't go on the chat room and attack Jim, the preacher. Don't do that. That doesn't give you any credibility, and that doesn't give me any either. And even when you write, I don't read a lot of these emails till I get up here. And if you're correcting me, I don't mind being corrected, but call me. I don't believe I know everything about the Bible. People say they'll quote some verse thinking I know exactly where it is. I haven't memorized the Bible yet. Memorized a lot of it, but not all of it. All right, we we talk to people all over the world. We've got people that are they're having problems. I've got about 25 people that we send money to every month. Um, we send them, I may send 50, 100, or $200. It depends on how sick they are. I've got several people that's got cancer. Uh, one lady that's got leukemia, she's coming up here to meet uh, everybody on a Wednesday night. I wish most of you'd come out. And uh, she's coming up on the 28th, I believe, of this month. She's going to be here a couple of days, not long. And uh, that's Robin Peters and her son, Whale. 
down in Amarillo, Texas. They're flying up here just to say hello, and they want to say how much they love the people. And, uh, and then we've got the lady over in Australia that's got cancer. It is metastasized. That means it's spread throughout her body. And uh, I don't know if she's got so long to live, but when it metastasizes, that means it's permanent. And uh, we just, we love her, and we love all these people, and we try to, I can't name all the people that we send money to. And there's a bunch of them. And I just want to, I want you to know that. And if you want to help these needy people, we've got a special fund at the bank. I go to the post office every day. I pull the letters out and I separate the funds for the needy from the operation funds for the ministry. If you send more money, I don't get that myself. I'm on a salary here, and I never, we're never going to raise my salary. I give, I give bonuses to the workers, Mike, Dave, Tom, and Mary, when we reach a certain level of offerings. But I don't take any bonuses. Uh, I'm just trying to encourage them Mike, Tom, Dave, and Mary all volunteered when they first come here. They said, I'll work for free for the ministry. I love this message you're preaching. And they all work for free, and I got to where I'd give them 50 or or $100 a month. Well, over the years, it's worked into a full-time job for them, and uh, I love all of them. I couldn't do this ministry alone without them. I'm, Tom does all the computer, and and uh, he knows a lot about computers. He he does the contacting people, and Dave takes care of the TV stations, and uh, Mike does all this camera work back here, and and uh, my wife Mary does. She's. Uh, a secretary, she all she has to do is get up out of bed and walk about 10 feet and she's in her office. That's about it. She don't have to drive nowhere. And uh, she takes care of things there. And we've got uh, this lady down in southern Louisiana. We're going to be getting her a wheelchair accessible van. She is paraplegic. Her name is Danielle. And uh, we love you, Danielle. Just continue to stick with us, and we will we will continue to preach the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. <coughs> Lord, I don't know how to express my thankfulness that you've opened up this book to us. Thank you for truth. I pray that you'll Make this make the church strong. I'm talking about all those people on the internet out there that are watching. Make them strong in the faith. Let them know that they have to go through the trials and tribulation through the narrow way. That if they're going through it, that's a sign they belong to you. And we'll give you praise for everything. Fight our battles in Christ's name. Amen.
I'm Jim Brown, your Bible teacher here at Grace and Truth Ministries. I'm talking to you about what baptism really is. It is not water. I've got a title up here. Baptism is our clothing. It is blood of Jesus. That's our baptism. It is not water. It is not H2O. Where in the world did that come from? Well, it started with the Pharisees when they implemented, when they implemented, this is the temple in the Old Testament world, and they had a, a glassy sea, a brazen sea. It was made of brass. Let me get my, let me get my uh, button here, see if I can't. Let me see if I can get this on the... This is where baptism, water baptism comes from. This thing is... There it is. All right. I just want to get over here to the... This is where water baptism was implemented from right there that's the glassy sea Moses told all the women go and bring me your looking glasses they had not learned how to make these uh, reflecting glasses like we use mirrors they hadn't learned to do that so what the women did they took brass and polished it and they could see this faint resemblance of them in the mirror and this reflection on these on these mirrors and and they put their lipstick on and whatever they want to do, paint their eyes. And Moses told them to bring your glasses, we need to make this glassy sea. When they first come out of Egypt, they had a laver, just a small laver. A laver. And then they as they increased in number and as all of these people in here have to be Levites, all of them, because only Levites could go in here and only high priests could go inside the Holy of Holies. So what they did, they brought this washing. What the, what the, what the high priest or what the priests would do as they would offer sacrifices that was required by God daily, they would go over here and offer the sacrifices on this altar. Except it wasn't a concrete altar. It was a it was a brassy altar just like the sea. I don't know I don't know why I never mentioned that. And it was a brassy altar. These are the horns of the altar. And the and the the priest or the Levites would make an offering. They'd come back, and you have little spigots on this on this glassy sea, and they would wash all over before in the morning before they went to offer sacrifice. After every sacrifice, they'd come back and wash their hands and their feet. That's where foot washing and hand washing comes from, and they. And so the Pharisees took this washing from the sea and put it into their into their proselyte baptism. So by the time you get to Jesus, that had been going on for hundreds of years. And the proselyte process was they had to be circumcised, washed in water. They, this was a Pharisee invention it was not commanded in the Bible not as a baptism for everybody and they would be circumcised that was commanded they they'd be circumcised and they would offer two turtle doves and that was also commanded that was the offering for a newborn baby in Israel two turtle doves 
and they had a washing in water and they got that from that glassy sea from this right here and they put that in there and said everybody had to be washed and they called that a new birth that's where it all kind of got started that's where the washing in water really comes out of Israel and they had that mixed in a lot of rituals of the pagans and uh, I'm here to tell you that's not true baptism Baptize, Mr. Girdlestone says, comes from two words. He said it had a dual meaning. It comes from baptizo and babto. Babto, Mr. Strong says, means to stain with the dye. Now, some people want to argue about this and say, well, it can mean to dip. Well, that's, uh, that's some of the latitude that they used and they inserted it. But when you go to the original meaning of the word, it means to cover, to cover with a stain or dye. A stain or dye. And Mr. Girdlestone says that's what it meant originally. But men began to corrupt the words even in the first and second century. Now, I've got a book by, I've got a book by Williston Walker, church historian. He said, Back in the first century, when many of the church fathers would baptize in water, they'd make you come to this place of baptism, and then they'd make you drink some milk, and then drink some honey, and then get down into the baptistry and curse the devil, and then come back out and had a big, had a big uh, hullabaloo about it. Just, we didn't make any sense. I believe that God's Word is true when He talks about baptism. The Bible doesn't talk about being baptized in water other than when it's in error. When Paul said, I baptize, I pray, I thank God, I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius and some of the household of Stephanus. I don't remember whether I baptized any other or not. He said that to the Corinthians. Now, the Corinthians, Corinth was a Gentile church. And therefore, the proselyte baptism would apply to them. And Paul, before he was converted on the Damascus Road, he evidently was over there washing people in water because he said, I thank God I baptized you. He, when he said, I baptize. He used a form of baptizo, but there's an E on, there's an epsilon on the front of it. That's called an augment. Just the fact that he said, I baptize, that means I baptized, augment. That means, he said, I thank God I didn't baptize any more of you than I did. That was when he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. And he said, I was more zealous in Galatians, the first chapter, more zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Not talking about his literal father, but the men who were Pharisees. And he says, I was a Pharisee in Galatians. That's the first chapter in Galatians. He says, I was a, well, not Galatians, Philippians. In Philippians, the third chapter, he says, I was a Pharisee. I was zealous of their paradosis, and this is the paradosis. So Paul had to have been going around baptizing people in water and he said I thank God I didn't do any more than I did because all I did was get you confused that you had to be dipped in water so he said I thank God I didn't do any more than I did and I've never heard anybody talk about this at all I've heard a few preachers try to address it and people will say well God wasn't talking about Paul baptizing with water well certainly Whatever he told the apostles, he was talking about Paul too because he tells the apostles, go to all the world, teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, but he can't mean water there. He has to mean blood. Because I keep saying this. I hope everybody's getting this. John is baptizing in Matthew, the third chapter. Matthew 3. And John says, I baptize with water, but there comes one after me. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, why would Jesus go through his ministry and meet with the apostles in Matthew 28 and tell them in the Great Commission, go into all the world, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Why would he tell them to go baptize with John's water baptism and not his baptism of the Holy Ghost? He wouldn't tell them that. Once you get Jesus dead, every time he talks about spiritual baptism, it is not H2O. It's talking about blood. And Paul wasn't baptized in water. People say he was. No. I'm going to say it one more time. Over here in Acts, in Acts, the ninth chapter, I'm just going to read it and show it. It doesn't even take a genius to figure this out, that he wasn't baptized in water. Look here at Acts, the ninth chapter. Paul is struck down on the Damascus Road. God blinds him until... Ananias comes and leads him and lays hands upon him and Ananias says to him in chapter 7 verse 17 of chapter 9 of Acts Ananias went into his went in his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on on him on Saul said brother Saul the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest hath sent me that thou mightest do two things. First of all, receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And then he t says, and immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. So he received his sight and he received his sight and was baptized. But that's the, the baptism here is the same thing as being filled with the Holy Ghost because that's the two things that we're supposed to do. So he wasn't baptized in water. He was baptized with the Spirit. I don't know why man can't see that. I just am amazed. Now, so when Paul said, I thank God I didn't baptize any more of you than I did because all that water will do is confuse you just like it confuses all these Baptists in America, and it confuses all the Church of Christ, and that way they get together and fight each other over which one is right. What I want to know is, what about the Methodists? Are they right? They sprinkle with water. Methodists sprinkle, that's more correct. Rentizo is the word, R-H-A-N-T-I-Z-O, means to asperse. And you can read there in, in the ninth chapter of Hebrews and it refers back to Exodus, the 24th chapter, Exodus 24, where Moses sprinkled the people with the blood of the sacrifice. He sprinkled with blood. And Hebrews 9, it refers back to this, how that the people were sprinkled with the blood. Sprinkle means to asperse and spread it all over. That's amazing to me. Sprinkling is more correctly what baptism is, but it has to be blood. But you can't sprinkle literal blood on somebody. That's not what it's about. It's about the blood of Christ. And when you go to 1 Peter... First Peter 1 and 2. Here's what the Bible says. We're elect unto obedience and the 
sprinkling of blood. That's what we're elected to. We're elected to be blood baptized with the blood of Christ. Baptism, like I've said up here, is our clothing. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. 27. What did I say? I meant 327. I've said that a thousand times. Galatians 327, put on Christ. It, many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on in duo. Boy, that's an interesting word. In duo means to sink into clothing. To sink into clothing, that's what, anytime you find in duo, let, let me go over here to 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit, now remember, I've said this before. Baptize was originally a verbal noun. It don't matter what men have done to it. Men have corrupted it over the years. It's just like, it's just like the communion. Communion was originally, it wasn't communion. It wasn't crackers and grape juice. They were eating the last Passover. And what they did... They did like we do. They kind of put their spin on it and did what they wanted to with it. And when Jesus died, they started getting together every first day of the week since Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week. And they had an agape love feast. Agape love feast. And that's where they would bring food and money for the poor. Food and money for the poor at that at that agape love feast. What happened to the agape love feast? The church historians will tell you. Wilson Walker will tell you. Enoch Pond will tell you. Here's where the here's where the so-called pressing around crackers and grape juice at what the churches call communion. They weren't eating communion. They were eating the Passover. There was a lamb there at the Passover. I've never seen anybody pass around a leg of lamb. Nobody. In the 14th chapter of Mark, the very chapter, and in the Luke, the 22nd chapter, the very chapters along with that 20, along with the 26th chapter of Matthew and the 13th chapter of John, it only has in the 22nd chapter of Luke, verse 7, and it has in, the, I believe it's verse 14 of chapter 14 of uh, Mark, it, it says that it came time to kill the Passover. What are they going to kill? There were three things called the Passover. There was the week of unleavened bread. They called that the Passover. There was the day that was Nisan 14. Nisan is our month, March, April. And then there was the lamb that they called the Passover. Which one of these are they going to kill? The lamb. Good grief, you preachers. I've never heard anybody read those verses and apply it anywhere to anything. And that was during this ceremony that the Baptists and Church of Christ and all of them had pulled it into the church and called it communion. They wouldn't eat communion. They're eating a lamb without blemish. They were, in, they were drinking four cups, and the third cup was called cup of blessing. They were eating unleavened bread for seven days, and we being many on one bread and one body. And the cup of blessing was the third cup of the Passover. And Paul talks about that in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And that's long after Jesus died. Why is it I can find these things? And they had bitter herbs. 
Jesus told her that he told him, I'll cause you to drink bitter herbs when you forsake me and leave me. And that is wormwood. That was the fourth item of the Passover. That was the sop. Good night. Why don't people define things? You bunch of Baptists in Church of Christ, you're disgusting. You don't know that there is a blood baptism. And many of you baptized into Christ have sunk into the clothing of Christ, but you don't ever take it off. And that's something, a blood baptism was a death. When Jesus asked James and John, can you drink the cup that I be, drink of? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? He wasn't saying, can we back up three and a half years and can you be dipped in water? He wasn't saying that. He was saying, can you die the death? I'm dying tomorrow. That's what he was saying. They said, yes, and he said, and you will. And then he says here in 1 Corinthians 12, i got to really point out something to you. This is very important. Mr. Strong says in a McClinican Strong, he says, baptized was a verbal noun. That's very important to understand, a verbal noun. A verbal noun. Now, I remember from, Matt, from uh, English. A verbal noun is an infinitive. Infinitive comes from infinite. When you're baptized, truly, it's infinite. It is from now on. It is a blood baptism. And it takes with the elect, and it's never undone. Never. It's infinite. And infinitive means... There's a person here. And there's a fluid that comes from an outer source. It's coming from an outer source. And that's God. And it's staining and dying the person. Stain and die. I'm not saying somebody didn't dip in water. I know a lot of people did. Even the Pharisees, they took it and modified it when they had it watered. They did that. They simply applied that brazen, this sea, into the proselyte process. And Jesus wasn't dead yet when they did that, so they could do that. The, here's the whole point. The baptizing comes from an outer person. And when the Bible says here in 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, for by one Spirit, what is the Holy Spirit? The Spirit is the truth. Truth is the word A L E T H E I A. Aletheia comes from the word lanthano. Lanthano means to hide or conceal or lie hid, conceal. And when you have in the Greek the alpha, the negative particle. Conceal. What? Conceal. Oh, conceal. <laughs> I get to write now, I'm sorry. Conceal. All right, thank you. It means not to hide or conceal anything. So, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you're baptized with not concealing or hiding anything. That you're going to pull the cover off. So, from the outer source God, He baptizes us with not hiding anything. That's a blood baptism because when you start telling people the truth that God does not love everybody, that makes most of the world angry. 
And they think the Bible says in John 3.16, God loves everybody in the world. He dis It doesn't say that. Good night, you preachers. It says, for God so, so, so loved. So's an adverb. Did you know that? An adverb tells how, when, where, and sometimes why. This tells how or in what fashion God loved for God in this fashion. It refers back to John 3, 14. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness when all of these deadly serpents were going into the camp of the Israelites, they were biting people and they were dying. He said, raise up this brazen serpent in the wilderness and whoever looks at this serpent will live. God in this fashion. God so loved the world in the same fashion. Whoever looks will live. But you have to have a seeing eye and a hearing ear. How can you hear whoever looks? How can you hear those words coming out of the mouth of God? Whoever looks, you can't hear that without a hearing ear. Who can see the brazen serpent without a seeing eye? The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made even both of them. Who can see? Nobody can. So the outer person that's sending this, he's sending this, not hiding anything upon his people. That's a blood baptism because you'll go out there and start telling people about predestination and Christmas is pagan. You'll even tell them that baptism is blood and it's not water. And when you tell them that, they'll go. Whoa. I had a woman walk up to me at public supermarket. She said, aren't you that guy on TV? I said, yes, ma'am. And I, I got to talking to her, and I said, well, I say some things other preachers don't say. She said, like what? I said, that baptism is blood, it's not water. And so I explained to her baptism with baptism and all this. She said, I'm Church of Christ. So I said, well, most Church of Christ and Baptists are not going to like this. <laughs> I just grinned and walked away. And I gave her a DVD. I don't know what I gave her. Most Church of Christ are not going to like when you tell them their water is not it. Tell the Baptist water is not it, that it's blood, and that you have to be martyred by telling people the truth because it had, by one spirit are we baptized. Let's read the rest of that. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. The body is the church. It's... <laughs> You're not baptized into a local church. The body is all the called out of God. It's the ecclesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. That's the word church. It's the called out. They're called out. Kaleo means to call. And ek means out. So you got two verses here. As many have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, but you don't do the baptizing. And a man doesn't do the baptizing like Paul tried to do. It's the Holy Spirit that baptizes you with truth and it, it teaches you to take the cover off and to tell the people the meaning of the words. I will say anything to anybody, anywhere, anytime. I really don't, and I don't beat them up. I just say, here's the meaning of the word, baptism with bapto. Bapto means to stain with a die, and a blood baptism was a death or a martyrdom. That's the way I'll say it. Dave was with me one day. I was talking to a mechanic. I said, tongues is, there's two words for tongue, gloss and dialectos, and I go in to explain it to him. And Dave said, all you do is talk to people. I said, that's all. I don't beat them up. I don't insist that they believe. And if I see this wandering look in their eye and they get a hazy, glazed look, I say, well, that's enough. I walk away. God's people don't have to be convinced of what the truth is. They've got hearing ears. If you can hear this, hear and obey are the basic same word in the Greek. They're the exact same word in the, in the Hebrew. Now, I want to talk to you about some things about putting on Christ. There's several places that, that we don't put on 
many different clothing. We've got one clothing. Let's go back over here to, let's go back over to Revelation, the seventh chapter. Go to Revelation 7. I'm going to give you some things about put on. That's interesting. Revelation, the seventh chapter. This is the baptism. It's blood. It is not H2O. Two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen. It's not what it is. That First of all, that's not clothing. If you dip, dipped in water, that'll dry out, and it doesn't protect you very well, does it? No, it don't. Now look here in the seventh chapter of Revelation. Revelation 7. This is an interesting thing. Revelation 7. And start reading here. In... Start reading here in the, uh, let's start reading in the ninth verse. And this is John speaking, John the Revelator. And after this I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and the four beasts fell before the throne, and their faces had worshipped God, saying, Amen or amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? I like that word arrayed. Parabalo. Para Ballo. Para is our word parallel. Parallel. And ballo means to throw. It means to throw all around clothing or to invest. And cloth, and cloth upon a person. So it's talking about they were arrayed, they were clothed with white robes. And then he goes on to say, they were clothed. That would have to be a synonym to enduo. It means to throw all around. In fact, there's a verse that goes with that in First Thessalonians 5, and verse 7. First Thessalonians 5. It'll go with this. Because it has basically the same meaning. First Thessalonians 5. Five. And verse 7. That's Timothy. I won't ever find it there. All right. Let's go to 5 and verse. Excuse me. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to or gay. He hasn't leveled us to the or gay. Or gay is feminine gender. And he hasn't appointed or the word is kimai, appointed us to to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Obtain is the word peripoesis. It has the same word 
P E R I P O I E S I S. It means to, this word peri means around, and poesis means to make all around us. The only thing that makes around us is our clothing. It's our clothing that makes around us. That's our salvation. It's what makes around us, which is the blood of Christ. And he says, it, it makes around us and it's our clothes. That's why I said this word paraballo, periballo, not para, peri. Periballo is that word over in Revelation, it's that word arrayed. It means to throw all around us, which is a clothing to us, and that would be the blood baptism. And then he goes on to say, goes on to say in verse 13 of chapter 7, and one of the elders answered saying, what are these that are arrayed or wrapped up in, with a, this clothing? In white robes. See, they're in robes, so that would be the clothing. The word robe is the word stole, S-T-O-L-E. You would, we would call it a stole. When a woman goes and buys her a mink stole, she wraps it around her neck and it plunges down to her waist or whatever. That's a stole or a stole. It, the stole means a long-fitting gown of dignity. That's because we're clothed in the blood of Christ. Notice this is all connected with the clothing of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Now, I'm going to give you another verse on this. It's, it's just very, very interesting. Go over here to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. You see, if you have something that's a clothing, like the stole is a clothing, it's a long gown all the way to the floor, and that's the robes that are white in the blood of Christ. And that's why he says, he had, the elder asked John, do you know what these are, these people clothed in white robes? He said, I don't know, you know, you tell me. He said, these are those who've made their robes White in the blood of Christ. White is a picture of righteousness all through the Bible. And our righteousness has to do with Christ's blood. The blood of Christ, how can men say that baptism is water as opposed to the blood of Christ? It's just like on that Ark of the Covenant. The high priest would go in and sprinkle that Ark of the Covenant. And he sprinkles the Ark of the Covenant seven times with the blood of the goat that's offered on this altar out here. And he sprinkles it seven times inside the Holy of Holies. If that's true baptism right there, because our hearts are sprinkled with the blood of Christ. That's a figurative term. There's no literal blood involved in it. It's talking about death to self. And when you start telling people and you've been, the, the baptism is not like Paul did it. He said, I thank God I baptized only a few of you in water because there's another baptism that people don't know anything about. Now, let's go over here and look at this verse. There's some verses here in Second Corinthians, the fifth chapter. I, I believe this thing of, I've never heard anybody come up and say that baptism was blood and that it was a death to self. I'm going to give you something here, if I can find it real quick. I'm not the only person that's ever said this that baptism is not water. Uh, let me see if I can find it. I want to help you see something. 
This is in McClinic and Strong. I'm going to look up Friends. You do know who the Society of Friends is, don't you? You don't know? That's what they call the Quakers. Friends. Let me look up Friends. It's so funny that the, the Methodists sprinkle people and the Baptists don't attack them for sprinkling, but they're going to attack me for saying it's blood, it's not water. It's just, all right, let me look up friends. And this is, you can look up so many things in the McClinic and Strong. It will tell you, here's what the Society of Friends say. They believe in, I think I know about where it is. And they will tell you that the Society of Friends of the Quakers, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Just listen to this. This now I'm not saying I'm going to become a Quaker, but they got some things right. Friends believe that the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost is the only baptism essential to salvation. I agree. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. The baptism of Christ is inward and spiritual, as may be shown by the following texts. It's spiritual. Talking about Quakers. We have no grounds to believe that the Passover, which Jesus ate with his disciples, was intended to perpetuate in the Christian church, nor does it appear that he instituted a new ceremony on that occasion. <laughs> That's what I've said. I didn't even know they believed that for years after I was already teaching this. I started to tell you a while ago that Mr. Pond, Enoch Pond, and Williston Walker, these are two historians. Read church history. They'll tell you the truth. And they both of these wonderful historians, they're very conservative, Bible-believing historians. And Mr. Walker says that about 156 A.D., somewhere in that neighborhood, they were having this agape love feast in the church. And they were under such persecution by the Roman Empire that they were trying to run from the Roman soldiers. They were hiding in the catacombs. That was those tunnels underneath Rome. They were hiding in the catacombs in caves, trying to hide from the persecution and being killed. See, they were trying to continue preaching the Word of God. And what they would do, this is what Mr. Wilson Walker says. He said they would bring a little sack with some, with some kind of food in it, maybe just a piece of bread, and then they would get together in some cave or in the catacombs, and they would say, did you bring a little flask of something to drink, a little grape juice? And they'd say, yes. And they'd say, you brought some bread? And they'd say, yes. And they would get together and eat some bread and eat and, and drink a little grape juice. Just to have fellowship, not anything else. And what's so funny is they said that at about 156 A.D., this agape, little agape love feast and all that they did, reduce it to a piece of bread and a little bit of grape juice in some cave somewhere. And they were exchanging that. And that about 156 A.D., it broke off, became a liturgy, in the church, liturgy is a ceremony. Or what, they, what we call a communion. Became a communion. And it's just not true. The, the Passover is spiritual. Passover lamb. Four cups. Third cup, cup of blessing of the Passover. When Jesus hooked the cup and blessed it. 
I don't know why I can break these things down and other men can't break them down. It's just, just disgusting. They don't look at details of anything. Now, look over here in second. In Second Corinthians, this fifth chapter of Second Corinthians is talking about us about when Christ comes back and changes our bodies and gives us a new body. He says, For we know that if our earthly house, this one right here, our body, if our earthly house of this tabernacle, the one we're in right now, were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That is the new house we'll have and the new body we'll have. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We'll be changed in a moment in the twinkle of an eye at the last trumps, and he'll give us our new body. One that can't sin. For in this we groan. Now remember the word groan is a form of straight. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And only a few will find it. Let me erase this. Let me get some space here. I really believe that blood is the true baptism. I believe the blood of Christ is one of the most important things in the Bible. When you find the blood of Christ, the shed blood, that means somebody's died. He died. He died for us. Then it goes on to say, For in this we groan. Now, let me give you some things about groan. Groan is the verb form of straight as the gate. Straight. Stenos. Stenos is the word straight. I've got a paper here. I've got every time this word straight is mentioned and every word that is a morpheme with it. Morpheme. I don't know how to give you all this at once. Morpheme comes from morphe. Morphe means shape. A metamorphosis. I learned this in the 10th grade from my, I'll never forget from Mr. Silverberg. He was my biology teacher in the 10th grade in 1954 at Beaumont High School in Texas. Mr. Silverberg. I didn't know Silverberg was a Jewish name. <laughs> I'd like to have known it at the time. Metamorphosis. And I've got a notebook somewhere where I've got the metamorphosis of a grasshopper. Meta means with, morphe means to shape, and it shows you this little bitty start and develop the grasshopper, and then he gets longer, and then he starts getting the legs, and he gets his antenna, and that's the metamorphosis. It has much the same meaning as sumorphos, sumorphos, M-O-R-P-H-O-S. That's the word to be conformed. That's what we are. That's so amazing because to be conformed is what we're predestined to. And that would go along with, to be conformed would go along with predestination. We're predestined to be conformed to the image icon and that would go along with death to self because 
when we're born again, we got an inner man and an outer man. And Paul said, I wrestle with that outer man. I don't know how to do anything right. He said that in Romans, the seventh chapter. He said, I got an inner man. That's the new birth. That's Christ in me. And I got an outer man that can't quit sinning. The inner man can't sin. And he puts you through fire and trials. He puts you through a blood baptism until you conform to the likeness of the inner man. So this predestination is the same subject as as it's the same subject as predestination but baptism. They're very closely aligned. So you've got these different words, straight as the gate. And the noise that we make as we're going through the straight gate as he's getting rid of self, Paul said the inner man serves the law of God and the outer man serves the flesh. Does anybody have any trouble with the outer man? <laughs> or would anybody like to lie? Everybody out there has had trouble with the outer man. Everybody that lives on the earth. That, see, I believe preachers ought to tell people that you've got to be blood baptized. And it may take you years to get a hold of this. But fighting the world is a waste of time. We all fought the world, didn't we? All of us. I fought the world. I would fight a circle saw when I was 32 or 33 years old. I would argue to the death. For what? I never changed anybody. I never have been fighting somebody, arguing with them. And then all of a sudden in the middle of the conversation say, well, I see what you mean. Never had that happen. Never. It doesn't happen. Now, in order to get to this fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians, I've got to give you these words. You've got stenos, which is straight. And this will give you the definition on this paper. It will tell you this word straight is only used three times in the Bible. Three times. It's used in Matthew seven thirteen. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and there is the way that leads to eternal life, and only a few will find it. So straight and narrow go together. What it's like. It's a straight gate. That's the entrance. That's just the entrance. Narrow is the journey. It's a narrow Filippo which comes from the word thalipsis. And every time you find tribulation in the New Testament, tribulation is the word thalipsis. In the world you shall have tribulation, but I have overcome the world. Those words seem so little. Overcome is the word In N I K A O. Overcome is a part of a fight, a battle. Overcome, the fight is with the outer man. That's a fight we're fighting. The inner man, Christ in you, is fighting the outer man, which is the flesh yourself. Flesh. Overcome is the verb. There's a noun form of that, N-I-K-E. looks like Nike, and I'm sure that's what the guys named it. I had a Greek word named those tennis shoes, Nike. When you see this on a shoe, that's Nike. Well, the Nike, Nike, Nike means victory. And what is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith? Even our death to self. Death to self is about that outer man dying. It's about him dying because of all of the blood baptism we're going through. The blood baptism. Now, 
I'm trying to explain some things that I've seen in all this. Philebo. I've got a... Here's... Every time the word Philebo is mentioned. Philebo. Reflecting on the original, properly rubbed together, constrict, compress. The world compresses us. Press together figuratively. Oppressively afflict. Distress. Like when circumstances rub us the wrong way. You don't like what's going on. The blood baptism doesn't feel good. It hurts. If you don't like it, too bad. <laughs> you're in it for the you're in it for the duration of your life. But the thing is, we have one another to comfort each and with. That's what we've got. And this word stenos, stenos, straight has to do with the narrow way. With narrow. Stenos means narrow, closely defined path God ordains to travel to gain his approval. The outer man must die. That has to do with conscience. Conscience. It takes two men to put a man to death. You can see that in Numbers the 35th chapter and Deuteronomy the 17th chapter, Deuteronomy the 19th chapter. It takes two witnesses. What God wants from you, he's going to get the outer man after so many years of fire and trial. He's going to get the outer man to vote with the inner man that self must die. And that's the word conscience. Conscience is the word S-U-N-E-I-D-E-S-I-S. -E -I -I -S. It comes from ido, meaning to see or perceive, see or perceive with, soon. Soon means with. This outer man has to see things the way the inner man says. That's, that's being a martyr and self has to die. It takes a long time for God to work on a lot of us. I like to never come to this till God put me in the hospital in my mid-40s, and I thought I was dying. I really believe that. Mary thought I was dying. Now, let me give you this. I want to give you these words that are associated with straight. Let me give you these. You have the word stenogmos, S-T-E-N-A-G-M-O-S. That is a morpheme. You can see sten, that's the stem of the word, sten, stenogmos. Stenogmos means groaning, especially brought on by circumstances creating great pleasure. You go out there to get what you want that pleasures you in life, <coughs> and spiritually it causes a groaning in your life. And you find this word in Acts 7. 34, when Stephen is standing before the Sanhedrin, he says, I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt. This is Moses. He's telling the story of Moses. I've heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. I've heard their groaning for 400 years. They're being beaten. I will send thee into Egypt, talking to Moses. He also says in Romans 8, 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. Prayer means to bow to the will of God. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Stenogmas. It's tough. And then, you got that word stenos. Then you have the word stenadzo, which is the verb form of stenos. Stenadzo. Stenadzo, these are all morphemes. 
They're word shapes. They're word shapes that come from the word stenos. They all have to do with the straight gate. That's the squeezing that people put us through. And you've got stenazo. All I might have to come back to this. There's several verses on stenazo. How much time to have, Mike? Thirty-three. All right. I'll come back to this. The other verse where you've got straight stenos is in Luke thirteen twenty-four. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Strive. You can't just walk into the straight gate. There's agonizoma, A-G-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. That's the word strive. Agonizoma. The agon was the arena where they turned the Christians into the arena at Rome. It's just amazing and the and the Caesar would let them fight all day long, and they would tell they would give them a sword when they'd go in there against some gladiators and say, "If you could kill that gladiator, we'll let you out alive." Well, those gladiators were honed killers, but the longer the day went when the Caesar would get tired, he would come up and say, well, I'm tired. Take the swords away from the Christians and turn them into the gladiators or the lions and they don't have a chance. That's why Paul said, God has appointed us last. He's made us a spectacle. Spectacle is the word theatron. T-H-E-A-T-R-O-N. A theater, something you viewed the slaughter. He said, we were appointed last. No swords, no defense. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. Strive agonizomai. Get in the agon. And by the way, that word strive is not an invitation. It's an imperative mood. That means it's a command by God. It's imperative. Agonize entering in. Agonize to enter into the straight gate. For many will say unto you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. They don't like the fire and the trial. When persecution and affliction arises, they are offended. They don't like, they like, they receive the word over there in Mark, Matthew 13 and Luke 8. They receive the word with joy when tribulation and affliction arises. They're offended. Oh, they say, oh, I like that preaching of the truth. Boy, that's really interesting, all those Greek words. We've had a lot of people come here and they walk away and disappear. A lot of them. Because they can't handle that. That's something we as believers have to learn to just leave alone. It's never going to be better than this. The only time it's good is when we're around one another. It's tough when you're out there one-on-one -on -one facing the world. The only thing that can give you strength and comfort is the Word of God. Memorize all these words you can. Memorize all the verses you can. And when you need to quote somebody, somebody, I tell people, if all you know is three or four Greek words, use them. Because when you use them on people, people don't know what they mean. Majority of people don't know. So you have to agonize entering in. Now, let's get back over here to the fifth chapter of Second Corinthians. For in this we groan. That's the word stenazo. In this we groan. Earnestly desiring to be clothed. That's the word clothed. We want to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. That word clothed is a very interesting word. It's the word ep. 
This is the word. Ep, E, N, D, U, O, M, A, I. Remember in duo? Means to sink into clothing. If many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, it means to sink. Epi means to superimpose it upon us. It means to cover our new world, our new body, with this new body of Christ. And then he goes on to say, For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed, epinduomai. In duo, that has to do with the baptism of and the clothing that we put on. You don't put on water. Water dries out. It doesn't stay with you. It's not permanent. It is not infinite. It's not an infinitive. Water is not an infinitive. Baptize is an infinitive. It's a verbal noun. It's infinite. Once you're washed in the blood of Christ, you can't get out of it. You can say, I'm miserable half the time. Well, that's okay. It's better to be miserable. That's I, The Bible says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. The light affliction, affliction is the word thalipsis. The, the light tribulation, this is a light tribulation for 70 years or whatever, however long you live. Of course, you don't get into the tribulation until you're 20 or 30 years old and you start living for the Lord. And then you learn these things a little at a time. And the more you learn, the stronger you get and the more willing you are to die to the flesh. If you ever come to the realization this baptism comes from God. God. That's why it's an infinitive. It comes from the Holy Spirit, which is God. It comes from, it comes from Christ, which is God. We're baptized by Christ. We're not baptized by a preacher into water. That's ridiculous. When you go into all of these words, let me keep reading here. For in this we groan. And that's that word in Romans 8 that talks about groaning. We enter into the narrow, we enter into the straight gate. We're going through the narrow way. People are pressuring us from all sides because we believe these things that are true and none of the and most of the world doesn't believe them. We've had this ministry going on 34 years and we don't we have very few people that attend here. Most of them will come on Sunday, but we meet them on Sunday at one o'clock and I'd like to invite everybody to come out on Sunday. Come on out and come back and see us here at the church. But most people watch us on the internet live. And then let me keep reading. For in this we groan, or let me get to the next verse. If so be that being clothed, being clothed is the word in duo. The same word as many who've been baptized into Christ have put, put on Christ. Put on in duo, sinking into clothing. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. Now, water makes you naked because it dries out and it doesn't last and it's not infinitive and it's not a verbal noun. And it's, how, how long has the world, has the church been twisting the word of God? Well, Mr. Pond says it, they started twisting it at the end of the second century. They were twisting it in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. Paul said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The mystery of iniquity was the mystery of anomia. Anomia is the word iniquity. It comes from namas, which is the word law. And the alpha privative, no law of God. It was here in Second Thessalonians, the second chapter. It was already here. 
So it began earlier than Mr. Pond says. He was simply talking about the political situation of the church when he said when they turn themselves over to synods and councils. That's the same thing as associations and conventions. The best scholar is not the president of the Southern Baptist Convention. He's far from a scholar. In fact, Adrian, Ro Adrian Rogers, Adrian, <laughs> Adrian Rogers, pastor of the Bellevue Baptist Church in Memphis, was twice president, and he hated the doctrine of predestination. He'll tell you that. You go online, you look up, you look up Adrian Rogers and predestination. He's got a message on there called predestinated for hell no. He's just an idiot. He was he's dead now. But he just but he talked with a big voice and big round voice and he impressed everybody because he was loud and noisy. There's nothing righteous about that, Adrian. Adrian. <laughs> Every time I say that, I want to say, Adrian. <laughs> All right. If so be that we being clothed will not be found naked. The only thing we can be clothed with is the blood of Christ, nothing else. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan. We do stenazo. We're in the narrow, with the straight gate and the narrow way. We do groan, being burdened, not for that which we could be unclothed. Unclothed is the word ek duo. Take off the clothing. Ek duo. It's the exact opposite of in duo. You're taking off the clothes. You're being divested of your clothing. He said, not that we would be unclothed, that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon. Clothed is that word in duo. That we would be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Let me tell you, water baptism ain't going to make mortality be swallowed up of life. Water is worthless. I don't know why you guys haven't studied these words, you preachers out there. You're disgusting. A blood baptism is one of the most important things things in the Bible. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. When, when blood is shed, there's somebody dying. It was Jesus dying for his elect family, for his wife, the church. And he applies the blood to our hearts, just like they applied the blood to the doorpost in the Old Testament. It was stained and died. It's like you guys, you bunch of preachers out there, I'm just disgusted with all of you because blood baptism is just like predestination. How's a man going to get to heaven without the blood of Christ? How's a man going to get to heaven if he can't accept Christ and if he can't pray a sinner's prayer and get there? God has to arrange his life to cross the preaching of truth somewhere, either reading the Bible here in some preacher. And when he reads the Bible and says these things, it cuts into his heart and he doesn't have anything to do with it. God applies the blood. That's the infinitive part of it. That's the verbal noun. He applies it and then you have to learn to die daily. You can make more people angry at you for just telling the truth of the Bible than fighting them. You can make them more angry saying, well, did you know that God doesn't love everybody? Well, I think he loves everybody. I think it's my opinion. Well, the Bible says he does it in that ninth chapter of Romans. In the fifth chapter of Psalms, it says he hates all workers of iniquity. When you talk to people like that, they don't know what to do with it. I've, I've had 
I got t-shirts that says God does not love everybody. I was in the bank one day. A woman says, I think God loves everybody. I said, well, the Bible says he loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. I just said it like that. She said, oh. She just said, oh, dropped her head. Because the world has been... They acclimated to the fact that God loves everybody because John 3.16 says so. It does not. I just, I am sick. I'm sick of the world and its attitude towards God. Let me finish reading this. I never thought I could take this fifth chapter of Matthew and tie it directly with baptism. But when you're talking about clothing or anything or arrayed that has to do with clothes. If somebody's arrayed, A-R-R-A-Y-E-D, that is clothing. When they've wrapped around with something, there's only one baptism, peripoesis, obtain, P-E-R-I-P-O-I-E-S-I-S, over there in the fifth chapter, in that ninth verse of First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, peripoesis means to make something around. That's the word obtain. That's the way salvation comes. Obtain. That means to wrap somebody with the blood of Christ. That's the only way there is to heaven. That's not like we don't have anything to do. He that doeth truth comes to light. How will you do the truth? God will both baptize you and give you the guts to stand up to people. When you learn enough of these words, you learn enough of the Bible, you'll say, that doesn't take much to learn. When you say God doesn't love everybody, and then you quote them there, start quoting to them in Romans 9 and verse 11, when Rebecca had conceived by one, even by Father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand. It was said in her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written in Malachi 1 and, and 1, 2, and 3. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. What do you think of that, ma'am? You, you can't. You can't convince the world of something when they hate it to begin with. They don't know what predestination is. We're predestined to conform to the likeness of Jesus. Whatever he was like, he was hated. He was grieved and sorrowful too. And then he says here, being burdened for that we would be unclothed but clothed upon in duo that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Our mortality, which means the ability to die, our mortality be swallowed up of our eternal life. And he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The Spirit is the one that baptizes us into the body, the church. Do you know why people baptize people? They think that's the way you become a member of the local church. So the church is not local, it's international. It's everyone in the body of Christ. You don't have to be baptized in water to be in the church. You have to be baptized in the blood of Christ to be in the church. You can't say somebody in a church in California that's never been baptized is not in the church with somebody that's in Tennessee that has been dipped in water. It depends if the guy had been dipped in water has never been baptized, blood baptized, he's not baptized. If the guy in California has been blood baptized in the blood of Christ but he hadn't been dipped in water, he's the one that's been baptized, not the guy here. I hate water baptism. I believe it leads people astray. That's what I believe. It's people who follow water baptism, they are, they're following the doctrine of the Pharisees. It's Phariseeism. 
It's a pretense. Dipping some bow in water and say, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. That's hypocrisy. It's like this guy Glenn said to me one night. One night he said, I preached on blood baptism. He said, if people don't deal with the blood baptism, they'll never give up their water. I don't see how you can believe in a water baptism and believe in death to self. Because blood baptism is death to self. Let me give you, how much time to have, Mike? Thirteen. Thirteen. Let me give you a couple more of these places about in duo. Look, oh, it, it doesn't matter what people think. There's not two different clothings we, that we put on. Look over here in Ephesians 4. 4. Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation. Conversation is the word anastrepho, A-N-A-S-T-R-E-P-H-O. Anastrepho means conversation or method of mode of living, mode of living. It's what you say and what you do and how you live. That's what conversation means. It doesn't mean it's just something that comes out of your mouth. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, the outer man. How long does it take to put off the outer man? Oh, 30, 40 years. Put off the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. That's the outer man. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the inner man. And put on the new man. That's, that's put on there is the word enduo. E-N-D-U-O. It's the same word as being clothed over there in the fifth chapter of Second Corinthians. Same word. And put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. I keep saying this. You don't have to jump somebody's case and chew them out. Just tell them the truth. If they're, if they're vessels of mercy, they will hear. All we're looking for... <laughs> All we're doing is looking for people that can hear. If everybody is deaf in the world, why are you going to get angry at them? If they can't hear spiritual things, well, I just don't think you know what you're talking about. Say, okay, i got to go. They're going to have to spend eternity in hell if they never come to the truth. Don't give them a hard time. They're going to have a hard enough time in eternity. We're for putting away he says, put on the new man. Wherefore, putting away, this is what you put away. When you put on the new man, this is what the outer man consists of. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And that's the new man. I guess the, the thing, the one chapter that says more about this than anything else about putting on this new man and what you put off. You go over to Colossians. Colossians, the third chapter. Colossians 3. If you then be risen with Christ, verse 1, seek those things which are above the word above is anno. A-N-O. Remember the word anno, thin, is the word. That's the word, except for man be born again. Anno, thin, from above. It means from above. From God. 
and these things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections, your phroneo, phroneo. That, remember that word? The Bible says men's affections are on the earth when they hate the daily cross. The daily cross has to do with the inner man telling the outer man you got to die. That's the daily cross. Set your affections on things above. Men's affections, they're phroneo when they hate the daily cross. Paul said in Philippians, the third chapter, men hate the daily cross because their affection is on earthly things. Earthly is the word gay, G-E. It means soil or dirt. That's all it means. What do you mean by that? Well, your car's dirt. You're made out of dirt. Your house is dirt. Your apartment's dirt. Your car's dirt. The gasoline you put in your car is dirt. The money a man pays you to work for him is made out of dirt. Everything that you can see, every material thing you can see is dirt. Everything. I can say this. New York City was here a million years ago. It was, just, it was unrefined. It was in the ground. So they learn how to go through all this smelting and making steel and making these girders and put up a big building. But it was dirt. Men hate the daily cross because they love dirt. Their mind, their phroneo is on earthly things. And he's saying, put your affection, your phroneo on things above. I don't think about things like I used to. Anything I have is God's. I don't try to dress fancy. Y'all don't see me buy a bunch of clothes. I wear all the same shirts. And the only reason I wear colored shirts is because the board is white, so it'll show up against the white board. I used to wear the same shirts all the time when I first started the ministry. I had about three shirts. I wore them every time. Glenn, the guy that got us on TV and started the TV thing. He said, you need some different colored shirts. Show up against the board. I said, well, all right. Well, I got some shirts. These colored shirts I don't wear during the week, never. I wear them to show up against the board. Why would I wear these when I could wear something that says God does not love everybody? I'd rather wear that so somebody can get mad at me. For we are dead in Christ, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, the, the members which are upon the earth. Mortify, necro, N-E-K-R-O-O. -O. Let me erase some of this. Mortify means to kill off. You know what necromancy is in, don't you? That means to talk to the dead. Necro means to kill off. So God is, and what he's talking about is this outer man. How long does it take you to kill off the outer man that likes things and stuff and lusts and goes after the world? How long does it take? Well, it took God 45, 44, 45 years to really work on me till I didn't want to do it no more. I just don't like the things I used to like to do. I don't want to go to the circus. I don't want to jump in a swimming pool. I don't want to go boating. I don't want to go bowling. I don't want to go to the fair. I don't want any of those. Why? I'm 83, that's why. Good grief. Never met an 83-year-old man who wanted to go jump in some hole that had water in it. And they called it a swimming pool. Got one in the back of my house. We didn't build it. It was there when we bought the house. I don't ever get in it. Never. I'm just not interested in it. You can come and swim in it if you want to. I mean, Mike comes out and swims in it. And, and uh, Sheldon and Zach, they'll come swim. 
I'm just not interested in dropping in a hole with water in it. <laughs> when you get to 80, be 83, you probably won't either. This whole chapter is about putting off. Kill off, therefore, the members which are upon this earth. Fornication. That's the outer man's interest. Fornication. Pornia means idolatry, harlotry. Pornia. Kill off idolatry. That's the outer man. Fornication. Unclean, uncleanness. Acarthosia. A-K-A-R-T-H-E-S-I-T-H-A-R-S-I-A. <laughs> Comes from Catholic. A-K-A-T-H-A-R-S-I-A. -A. Comes from the word Katharos. K-A-T-H-A-R-O-S. Katharos, we get our word cauterize from that. Cauterize means to cleanse some wound. When you have the alpha in front of that, it means no cleansing. Unclean. So, it means impurity. Then it says inordinate affection. Inordinate affection. Pathos is the word affection. Inordinate means something that's unnatural. When somebody loves a woman so much that I can't live without her, I'll die. I'll kill myself. That's an ordinate affection. If I can't have that car, I'll just die. I'll, I'll work three jobs to get it. That's an ordinate affection. It's insane. You can love something too much. You can love your flesh too much. Put it that way. And then he says, in order of affection, evil concupiscence. Concupiscence is the word epithumia. It's the same word as lust. Epithumia. E P I T H U M I A. Epithumia is also the word covetous. Or lust. Epithumia means to breathe hard. Superimpose breathing hard after. I, 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 I gotta have that. I gotta have her. That's very, very wicked. And you gotta put off. That's all the outer man. And then he gets down here further in the. He tells you more to put off in verse 8. And then he tells you on down here in the text, put on, verse 12. And he tells you the things you have to put on. Put on in duo. That's the blood baptism. When your blood... Am I out of time? Yeah. I'll come back to this and finish this up next time. This thing of putting on, the, the baptism is blood. It's not water. I don't know why. You know why I have learned what I've learned? I have learned that I can't believe all the scholars that are out there, that I can examine these things myself, and I'm just as good as some Greek, Greek teacher who says certain things mean some things. I don't believe there's any such thing as a Greek expert. Oh, I believe there's some men educated in the Greek more than others. But they draw a lot of conclusions that are not true. I've never heard anybody talk about a blood baptism the way I'm talking about it here. Nobody in my life. Is it true? Absolutely. Well, let's pray and... Uh, And I'll come back and resume here. Lord, thank you for your, your word, your truth. God, help us to be strong in the word. Help those that are watching to, get, to be strong. Help them to know how to get rid of that outer man that we cannot let it rule our life. 
It's nothing but our anger and our rage and wanting our way. Lord, you have your way in our life. Fight our battles. In Christ's name, amen. I want to come back and talk more about stenazo. That's the groaning that we're going through. I don't see how men can teach one lesson on one subject. Say, we're going to cover this subject here. I heard John MacArthur said he was going to do a, a lesson on Revelation in one lesson. He uh, can't do that. He's not going to define anything, that's for sure. John has disappointed me because I used to follow him, thought he was just really such a smart man years ago till I was paying real close attention to him. I 